kei ngā maunga whakahi, kei ngā wai whakatere tanifa, nau mai rā ki te ana o ngā rai o nā. Welcome to Mapa with me, Mihi Ngārangi Forbes, brought to you by the Māngai Pāho and the Public Interest Journalism Fund. Today we have a special extended interview with Labour leader Chris Hipkins, filmed here in Mātangi Reia, the original Māori Affairs Select Committee. Tēnā koe te rangatira. The tax system is an instrument to raise revenue to fund the government's social and economic aims. And despite the inland revenue funding, the richest 8% of our country received about 80% of their income through capital gains. This government ruled it out. And despite your own former revenue minister supporting a wealth tax, this government ruled it out. So how do you plan to pay for health, education and now free dental? Tax is not the only way that you can tackle inequality and the policies that we're introducing and implementing as a government are actually I think making a meaningful difference on inequality in New Zealand. So if you look at our track record on child poverty for example, we've lifted children out of poverty every year that we've been in government. We're continuing to expand the access to quality public health care, quality public education um, and we're doing that using the existing tax system that we have at the moment. Um, I think we are making a difference and we are making a dent in inequality in New Zealand. That doesn't mean that our job's done, we've got a lot more to do. I think if you're using a universal lens you can see some gains but when we look through a Māori lens we're still seeing huge inequities in health and housing and education. There's 60,000 Māori that are homeless right now so you know, wouldn't it be better to have a fairer system where, where you've got more money to spend on those things? I'm really proud of the work that we're doing with Māori and with iwi up and down the country around building more houses because ultimately that's how you get out of the housing crisis and how you do home, you know, give, give homes to families or create homes for families. The fundamental challenge around housing in New Zealand is we haven't built enough houses over a long period of time, we're talking decades, yeah. to keep up with the population growth that we have. No matter how you fund it, it's never going to be possible to turn that around overnight because building those, you know, building the volume of houses that we need to build takes time. We've really ramped up our house building program and we're seeing real results coming out of that now. So my message really is we can't afford to turn back. We can't afford to stop, we can't afford to slow momentum. The momentum in terms of building new houses has really picked up and we've got to keep it going. I'm going to talk about houses uh, in a second but I just want to come back to you know these, these taxes because they're a real issue at the moment and people are um, asking, you know, talking about them. So what about a land tax? Parts of Australia are using it in Canada. Uh, one of the previous tax working groups has suggested it. Is that an option? It's not something we're looking at at the moment. I mean, the, the main form of land tax we have at the moment are local government rates, you know, which are levied on a combination of land and asset value, that, of what, whatever sits on top of that land. So we already have that at the moment. We're not proposing to expand that further. The one area where I have seen proposals um, uh, is around transport infrastructure, and that's what's called value capture, which mm. is effectively a form of land tax or land levy based on where you're building new roads and who's capturing the value from those. And we have left that open. Uh, the National Party are promising that they're, they're effectively going to do it. We've left it open as an option, but we're not proposing to go further than that. The average New Zealander pays about 20% of their income in tax. Why wouldn't the average landowner also be paying some tax in their land profit? Well, ultimately, it's, it's got to be a question of realised gains. So levying people based on assets that they own that they may never realise the gain from, it wouldn't be an equitable way of taxing people. So if you think about a family farm, for example, it might have been handed down through the generations. Um, it might well be worth us, you know, millions of dollars. That doesn't mean that the people who own that are in a position to pay potentially large taxes based on uh, the value of their land if they n are never going to realise the value of that land. But if you're buying and selling, you're realising the gain. So that's a question around capital gains. Now we've we've put in place the bright line test or we've expanded the bright line test that was put in place by the previous national government so that those people who are more actively buying and selling in the housing market for example will actually pay tax on that. Is it enough for a fairer tax system? It's a, certainly a step in the right direction. There's always more work to be done in terms of making sure the tax system is fairer. We've got a proposal to remove GST off fruit and vegetables for example which is a minor change to the tax system but one that will make a difference and it will certainly help people on lower incomes to be able to afford health their choices. We're sticking with the extension of the Bright Line test whereas the other parties want to roll that back because we do think that people who are actively speculating in the housing market should actually pay tax on that. This election the key message is cost of living 
and in recent weeks, energy companies have reported a combined increase in net profit of 1.3 billion, that's 600% increase. And Bank and Kiwi Bank announced a profit of 4% and ASB is up 11%. So what about an excess profit tax to deal with those obscene profits? Well, ultimately we want to make sure that the markets in all of those areas are competitive so that you know, the people operating in them aren't making excessive profits. So if you take supermarkets, if you take banks, if you take uh, electricity companies, we want to make sure that those are competitive markets. Um, the electricity companies, th there's, a, there's a shift um, in the nature of um, you know, where our electricity demand is coming from and, and, and how we're meeting that demand. Um, and you know, that, that market is in significant, a period of significant transition as we move away from burning fossil fuels to a much greater reliance on renewable energy, which will mean prices that ultimately um, uh, don't grow as fast as they would if we were still going to be relying on fossil fuels. So some of that money will be uh, money that's reinvested, for example, in making sure that we actually have the renewable electricity generation assets that we need to be able to meet that demand. Mm. I would never rule out um, you know, looking at making sure that if, if companies continue to make excessive profits, the government might do more in that area. But my first port of call would be more in the regulatory space to make sure they're not making those kind of big uh, unjustifiable profits in the first place. The energy reforms of the late 90s haven't really turned out as intended, particularly if you're poor or if you've got debt. And so not only do we have the issue of energy poverty, we also have the burden on the health system of people who can't afford power and who are turning up sick, and it's in the millions. I think the market reforms driven by the then national government in the late 1990s were fundamentally flawed. The challenge is that you can't unscramble an egg. You know, once that's been done, it's been done. I think our focus has to be but on... But can't you tax them? Can't you tax them when they're making ex ex excess profits like this? Well, I don't want to see them making those excess profits in the first but place. They are. So I, I want to see us focused on generate, you know, creating a renewable energies electricity market, which includes the ability for people to generate their own electricity, um, you know, more, more solar and, and more initiatives like that, um, that will allow people to be generating locally because that is actually going to be cheaper, it's going to create more resilience. If you look in the Hawke's Bay, for example, those, uh, those places that had solar panels on their roofs actually survived better when the power got cut because of the cyclone. So there's all sorts of reasons why we should be investing in that kind of future. So that's the energy companies, but what are the banks generating with the excessive profits? Well, that's of course a significant area of conversation with the banks. Um, we've, we've had some pretty robust conversations with the banks about that. Um, and it is an area where, where I'm not ruling out, you know, doing more things in the future, but my focus really is on making sure that that market's competitive rather than necessarily introducing new forms of taxation. But you've been in government for six years. Why are you waiting just before the election to have a discussion with the banks about the excessive profits when we've got a cost of living crisis? It's certainly not something that we're just doing right now. But we've been working on these issues right the way through. I think everyone will look, you know, appreciate that the pandemic period, you know, we had about two and a half years of huge economic volatility, where it was, you know, the, the main focus was on fighting COVID-19 and supporting the country mm -hmm. through that. And we saw the banks making quite big profits during that period of time. That doesn't mean that those profits are going to continue as more normal economic conditions return. But so it, these, are, these are things that we continue to Can work on. Can we expect some kind of a tax on banks, uh, an excess profit tax? It's not something that we're proposing at the moment. Recently we visited a kōhangareo in Wainui or Mata. I spoke to a 21-year-old kaiafina her job's to support a non-verbal student. It's an important job. Uh, she has no kids of her own, she's got no mortgage to worry about, but she is constantly stressed about the cost of living. She has to choose between putting gas in her car or kai on the table. On the back of those profits that we've just talked about, is this even okay? The main thing that we've done, for, you know, to use that very example, delivering pay parity for uh, the people who are working in Kohangareo is a huge advance forward. It means that they're actually being paid a fair day's pay for a, a really important day's work. Yeah. So I'm really proud of the track record that we've done there. I, I really believe that one of the ways that you can level the playing field economically is by making sure that we're generating the sorts of conditions where people's pay accurately reflects the contribution that they're making to our society. You know, a lot of what we talk about when we're talking about tax is about how we redistribute after the fact. Actually, if we create the right economic conditions where people are being properly rewarded for the hard work that they're doing, we wouldn't need to have that conversation quite so much. So the work that we're doing around growth 
growing wages, I actually think that is one of the big answers to inequality. And she would receive pay parity if she was a teacher. Uh, she's not, and she says training to be a teacher on the job is really difficult. But adding to that, Kohanga now has a waiting list of a thousand tamariki. So as the government that is supporting the revitalisation of Te Reo, how do you feel about a thousand tamariki missing out on their real journey. And this is a challenge right the way across that early childhood space, whether we're talking about, you know, conventional early childhood centres, kohangareo and so on. You know, when I say conventional, I mean English, English medium, um, uh, 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 early childhood education services. And the, the teachers who are not qualified in, in English medium services also, we are encouraging them to get their qualifications and then they'll be able to access higher pay mm -hmm. as a result of that. We've got more work to do with kohangareo to support those teachers to be able to do that. So you've introduced a new grocery commissioner. In 2022, the Commerce Commission found supermarkets were making 420 million a year in excess profits. When can New Zealanders expect to see some changes in their grocery bills? Well, by the 1st of April next year, when we um, remove the GST of fruit and vegetables, if the Labour Party is, is re-elected to government. That's and not associated to the excess profits though, is no, it? No, but the work that we're doing with the Grocery Commission, it will allow us to actually help to drive down um, you know, excess profits and also make sure that savings are passed on to consumers. The other thing that we need to do more of is make sure that we've got a genuinely competitive market. Now, the Grocery Commission is only one part of that. The work that we're doing to change wholesale distribution supply chains where at the moment they're locked up by two big companies so that more competitors have access to that. That will actually make a difference in making the market more competitive so that those kind of excess profits that we've seen can't be generated in the first place. But when do you expect to see some kind of a result? I don't think it'll happen overnight but I think we will see progress over the next year or two. You've spoken a lot about fairness and I want to ask you how fair the treatment has been for the whānau of Wakatū, who for more than 180 years now have been attempting to hold the Crown liable for failing to reserve the tenth's land in Nelson. In 2017 the Supreme Court ruled the Crown owes a fiduciary duty to those whānau and referred their case back to the High Court to determine and remedy. What does determine and remedy mean to you? Um, ultimately we have a process, I don't, I'm not familiar with each and every individual claim that's going through the process and that the government you know, is, is negotiating with. We do have a minister who probably you know, will be able to give me chapter and verse on any of the individual claims. But I do recognise that the treaty settlement process that we have for breaches of the treaty right the way across that 180 year period is not providing 100% redress for the past wrongs and it never has, it's only ever been providing a fraction of the redress for the past wrongs. Um, but I do believe that that is a good process. I do believe that it is a good, positive way forward for the country. This is interesting because this isn't a Waitangi Tribunal case. It's a property rights and contract case. And it's actually been with Minister Parker since 2017. And it's now 2023. That's six years I've been ignored by the Crown. Hmm. What's your suggestion for them? Um, look, I, I don't know the details of their individual case, so you know it's not something that I've been briefed on uh, in recent times, and so I, I just couldn't give you an, an educated comment on that. Yeah, but it's a property right though. It's not a Waitangi Tribunal claim. So in terms of property rights, would somebody who's lost their property and the Supreme Court's ruled that it should be remedied by, by the Crown, should they expect to have some kind of a return? Well, I think they should absolutely expect the Crown to take that seriously. Um, it's not a, this, is, this particular case is not one that I know the most up-to-date details on though. Would you be asking your Minister to remedy that? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I'm sure they'll be very happy since the case has taken 180 years to resolve. Um, we've been out on the road talking to Māori about what are the big issues and housing always comes up. And as we know now that if you're renting, people are spending close to 50% of the income on rent. Māori are big renters. How would you grade your team on handling housing? I think we've made an enormous amount of progress. I'm, I'm, I've never been you know, into this idea that you give yourself a number out of 10 or anything like that for any of the work that we do as government. I think we've made enormous progress. What we know from our history as a country is that where the government is active in the rental housing accommodation market, 
rental accommodation is more affordable and more people are being housed. We're building more homes, more you know, affordable rental homes, public homes, than any government since the 1950s. Yeah, sure, it took longer to scale up that program than anyone would have liked. You know, we had to take what was housing New Zealand from uh, effectively what had become an agent for selling off former state houses um, to one that's actually now building them again. We've done that and now we've got a really significant build program underway. I know, you know, when you go around the country and you look at where state houses were built in the past and you look at where rentals were affordable at that time when they were built, it was because of the state house building program. And so I think that's the biggest thing that we're doing that is going to change that. Now it's not going to happen overnight. We've got to build thousands, tens of thousands of houses. We've built about 13,000 so far and we've got more coming. Mm. And it, that is going to be the thing that's going to turn around. Kainga Kori is the Waitangi Tribunal report in response to Māori homelessness. It found in 2018 Māori were four times more likely uh, to be homeless than others. And when you talk to housing advocates like Te Puyo Marae, they say that that's actually low. It's about 60,000 Māori that are now homeless. What do you know about the situations of, the, of these whānau that are homeless? I think the answer to, to, to grappling with this is to work with local iwi to make sure that the housing solutions that we've got aren't just about building a house, but they're actually about dealing with all of the other issues and all of the wraparound that's required. In many cases, these families will be in very vulnerable. They'll be dealing with other issues as well, whether it's disconnection from the education system, it'll be house, health issues and so on. And I think the way that we can do that, because we know that within that cohort, the, all of those other social um, pressures are there. And so we know that it's not just about building a house, it's actually about making sure that people are supported into more sustainable living, um, housing being a big part of that, but also all of the other social support that we can work with iwi to make sure that we've got in place. So most Māori are living in the city and Mahi Kaora is doing some great things if you are fortunate enough to be able to live on your papakaina. But there are, let's just talk about the Māori that are living in the city, so that's Kainga Ora and that's Kiwi Build. How do you think they are doing for Māori? Well, if you look at the Grays Avenue development, for example, right in the heart of the Auckland CBD, a social housing partnership effectively with Kainga Ora and a range of different social service agencies that's really targeted at those, some of the most vulnerable in our community. And we know that Māori are disproportionately represented in the group that that housing development is going to be working with to accommodate. Because it's not just about a roof over the head, it's also about the fact that if people have been living rough, for example, and this particular housing development will accommodate people who have been in that situation. Mm -hmm. You've also got to wrap other support around them if you're going to get them into more sustainable housing. You know, if we're talking about vulnerable whānau, we're talking about those who have been helped into accommodation through Kainga Order. But there's also New Zealanders that are being helped into homes through Kiwi Build. Yes. Um, how many houses has, has Kiwi Build built? Kiwi Build's built about 3,000 homes so far. Um, Obviously, it's it's not it's not you know hit the sort of targets that we originally envisaged for Kiwi Build, but we found other ways of actually delivering on the overall approach there. So, for example, scaling up the state house build program, the public house build program, actually in terms of targeting the demographic who are homeless and who are most vulnerable, that's actually going to reach that demographic faster than Kiwi Build would be able to reach them. And so, all in all, how many homes do you think that you've been able to upskill, upgrade, build? Well, I mean, it's a, I haven't got a single number on it, but we've got about 13,000 uh, new public homes that have been built under our government, uh, around 3,000 Kiwi build homes. We've had record consent levels, so the private sector's been very, very active in building more homes as well. And of those houses, how many of those houses have gone to Fano Māori? Oh, I, I, don't have a, I don't have that breakdown. When I asked Minister Woods this in 2021, she didn't know the answer, but later her office contacted us to say around 5%. Uh, that's about 400 whānau Māori that have been helped into first homes. Is that equitable? Uh, not, not every government program is going to work for every population demographic. I think the work that we're doing with local iwi around papakainga housing, for example, I think is probably going to make a bigger difference for Māori. Um, the work that we're doing around you know, building more affordable rental accommodation through the public housing programme, that's probably going to make it, in the short term, make a, big, a bigger difference. But there's plenty of Māori that have got an opportunity, you know, are able, you know, because I think Māori income's gone up by about 7%, so there's probably first home buyers out there. It, what it looks like is that they're not getting the opportunity to get into some of those homes. The Waitangi Tribunal report Kainga Kore says the Crown has failed in its obligation to ensure rangatiratanga over Kainga under Te Tiriti. 
wouldn't Kiwi Build be the perfect mechanism to get Māori back on the property ladder? I, I'd still like to see us delivering more new builds, you know, for first home buyers through Kiwi Build. Uh, I'm not going to promise the sorts of numbers that we were talking about six years ago because I don't think we're going to achieve those kind of big numbers. Um, but I will also, you know, give an undertaking that I don't think that there should be discrimination within that. And if Māori are disproportionately underrepresented in Kiwi Build numbers, then that is something that we should. Would look you at. have a target then? Um, I think you know, if 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 it was, if. If Māori as a percentage of first home buyers are not being reflected in the numbers around Kiwi Build, then yeah, that is something we should look at. You've got a real battle on your hands with severe weather events and the homes being destroyed. You know, what kind of plans are you putting into place so that you're building more houses than the weather's destroying? I, look, I think we've got to do two things. We have to make sure we're mitigating the effects of climate change so that this doesn't keep getting worse. And we have to, we have to focus on adaptation. So we've got to make sure that where we're building homes, for example, we're not building them in places where they're going to be flooded or where they're going to um, you know, fall down the side of hills. Um, so we've actually got to work really hard um, to make sure that we're doing both of those things. I really reject the notion that we need to just switch to adaptation and forget about mitigation. We still have to make sure we're turning down the climate emissions and the problem, and we're not making the problem get worse. Exactly, because last month the UN sent a grave warning and you would have heard it, global warming's ended and global boiling has begun, mm. so things are really changing. And when we look at the agriculture, how agriculture accounts for half of our emissions, we still don't have a starting date to include this sector into the framework to reduce emissions. Do you have an idea? Oh, no, we do have a starting date. We, we've set that out just very recently. So we've said that we'll have um, measurement in place by the uh, second, uh, the, sorry, the fourth quarter of next year. So um, by, by the September quarter of 20, uh, 2024. Um, and then we will have pricing in place a year after that. So we do want to make more progress there. Now we're and the when only. When will it start? When will it start? By by 2025, by the by the fourth quarter of 2025. And at the moment, we're the only party that's actually uh, putting forward a, a concrete pricing mechanism to be in place by then. The National Party is saying sometime next decade. The ACT Party is saying not at all. And the Green Party is saying they want to go back to the drawing board and start again. So uh, you know, I I think we've actually got a very concrete plan to tackle this issue. I want to talk about the aspirations your party has for Māori. You launched the Labour Māori campaign at Ngāwhari a while ago, but there weren't any major policy announcements. Why not? We were just getting underway with the campaign. We don't always announce new policy at every campaign event that we do, um, but the policies that we've announced since then, um, I think, will make a difference. So, you know, GST of fruit and vegetables, free dental care, which we announced over the weekend, we know that Māori uh, will really benefit from that. Um, we've targeted that, you know, 20 to 30 age demographic because we know that's where dental decay starts to really kick in. Um, so, we know that in terms of the longevity, the, the long term outcomes for Māori from policy like that will be huge. How will you measure your success because you know we only have to go back to the Kiwi build figures to to know that sometimes Māori are just getting left behind in the kind of universalism of your policies? Overall if you look at healthcare one of the reasons that we established the Māori Health Authority in the first place is that we do accept that Māori have been disproportionately underserved by our public health system so by having the Māori Health Authority we can change that. We were going to ask you a question about sausage rolls, but we've run out of time. So, New Zealand first or Te Pāti Māori? If you get uh, the numbers. Oh, look, I've already said that we won't work with New Zealand first. And I've also said that we have worked with the Māori Party in the past. And I believe that we'd be able to do that again. What do you like about Te Pāti Māori? Um, but look, I, I get on on a personal level, I get on very well with both of their co-leaders. Um, and, uh, you know, that doesn't mean that Rawari doesn't shake things up now and then. And I don't agree with some of the things that he says publicly. Um, but I do believe that we could have a constructing work, working relationship. But that's ultimately what the voters decided. And can you work with Mika Whaiteri? Yes, I can. And I have in the past. Te rangatira tēnā koe. Thanks for tuning in to Mata with me, Mahinga Rangi Forbes. Ka nui te mahi ki te puna whakatongarewa, mi te mangai pāho, no horo mai.